I am somewhat of a neat nick. I like things in order. I like them to add up and stack up. I like things to be organized. I'm that part of the odd couple. Are you that way? Now, there's that one drawer in the kitchen, but except for that, except for that. But uh, there are some people who are that way, especially about their lawns. Now, I'm one of those people who happens to be really glad to be in a season in my life that someone else is taking care of the landscaping around me. And they do a whole lot better job than I would have done. But I remember my very first church. The manse was right next to lawn of the month guy. <laughs> member of our church whose lawn was just the perfect manicured golf green, you know. He clipped it with scissors and weeded it with tweezers. And there were butterflies that danced as if they were Disney models in some way. It was just this perfect award-winning azaleas. And he used to always say to me, you can tell a lot about a person by how they take care of their yard. Well, somehow my neat neck stuff inside the house never quite made it outside the house because my house looked more like this. <laughs> and somehow in the humor of God and the mistakes of the HOA, these yards end up next to each other. I don't know why it is, but if you've had yard of the month, you always live, live next to somebody like me. You're growing marvelous azaleas. We're growing world crops of dandelions. And because of the wind of the spring, occasionally we share our dandelions with you, even though you don't share your azaleas with us. Weeds. Who could love weeds, right? We spend so much energy getting them out of our flower beds, out of our gardens, out of our wheat fields, for that matter. Weeds. A weed is, de is by definition, a plant that is far more bad than good. Weed is not good. Except for Colorado, weed is not good. <laughs> Need to hasten to say... Our children's coordinator is not going to Colorado for that reason. <laughs> Weed. <laughs> no, but if you've ever served in a restaurant, you'll know what being in the weeds means. That means there's so many people seated in your section, you cannot possibly get them all served. And meanwhile, they're getting more and more unhappy, and you're watching your tip disappear because they're in the weeds. Think about that next time when you're the person and that's that frazzled. But maybe you know of someone who gets lost in details in a project. And we say to them, they're just in the weeds. In the weeds is not good, right? Who wants to be into weeds? Well, Jesus tells a story about weeds. And it seemed appropriate for us to look at it together. He actually told a number of parables that had a farming background. And this is one of them. You remember he told a story once about a sower and some of the seed landed on thorny ground where the weeds came up and choked it. So, you know, weeds are a big deal among farming folk. Here's another story about weeds. And he put before them a parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So, when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered them, An enemy has done this. So, the well-meaning and eager slaves said to him, Well, then do you want us to go and gather them, weed them out? But he replied, no, cool your jets. Well, that's not in there, but, but no. <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> For in gathering the weeds, you'd probably up wheat, uproot the wheat along with them. Tell you what, let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers... Collect the weeds first, carefully separate, bind them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat into my barn. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, said those of you who grew up in Catholic or Episcopal churches. <laughs> what an odd little story. Especially odd because 
Everybody in Palestine in that day was very familiar with weeds growing among the wheat, but nobody, I mean nobody, would have ever conducted their farming in this way. So when Jesus would have told the story, everyone in that agrarian society would be scratching their heads saying, well, I can tell he's a carpenter, he's clearly not a farmer because this is not how you farm. What you did in those days to protect the wheat, you would go out there and attack it early and often, two or three times during the growing season, and weed out the weeds. If you have a King James Bible, it's called tares. If you have some other Bible, it may be called darnel. If you're really into weeds, the actual weed is called lolium timulentum. That's our memory word for the day, lolium timulentum. Thought you wouldn't learn something at church. There you go. Lolium timulentum is a particular pesky weed that grows up right alongside the wheat and looks very much like wheat. When it first comes out of the ground, it looks just like wheat. Even when it comes up into the full ear, you know, and has the kind of burr and the, the seeds, it looks a lot like wheat. But it's not like wheat because in its maturity, it forms these little black seeds and if those seeds get mixed in with the wheat and baked into the bread, it can actually cause blindness and even death. So smart farmers were weeding out the lolium timulenti, not because they wanted wheat field of the month signs, but because it was poisonous and dangerous to have this seed around, this weed around. Okay, given that, and Jesus describes a farmer who says to the eager and well-intended and seasoned farmhands with sickle and hoe and, and saber in hand, we're ready to go do battle with the weeds, just say go. It's amazing that this farmer would say, nah, come up here on the porch, let's have some lemonade and let's just watch this for a little bit. They would have been stunned. And it's the beginning even of already knowing, as is almost always in Jesus' parables, he's up to more than you think at first. These innocent-seeming stories are Trojan horses that are going to open up on you if you give them a chance. And so he's not really talking about and teaching horticulture. What he's doing, he's trying to correct human culture. He's always doing that. No, let's just let them go. What is this master or the master storyteller What's he thinking? Well, here's part of it. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a weed and a wheat, between a bad plant and a good plant. Sometimes hard to know. This morning, I got to our church, and we spend a lot of energy. Our, everything's done here with excellence, but we had some weeds growing in our church's lawn this beautiful St. Augustine and all that. And I went out there just collecting these weeds up. They were everywhere. I thought, we, I can't have this. But then the more I started to try to collect them up, they were everywhere. I mean, they were just everywhere. These little white flowers on them. And they were just sort of scattered out there like a dusting of snow. How could that have happened? Did an enemy sow these? Some disgruntled church member? <laughs> Some agnostic who's against the Christian faith? Where'd these weeds come from? Of course, then it occurs to me, it did look a little bit like the dusting of snow. Maybe this is God's gentle way of making our northern friends feel welcome this time of year. <laughs> Maybe there's something, because it's hard to tell the difference between a weed and a wheat. Take the lowly dandelion, my favorite crop that I was raising in that first church home. A dandelion is by every measure and officially labeled a weed. Weed, of course, it's a weed. But... One of our church members was telling me just this week that when she was a child, they used to take the stalks, little stems, they're hollow, of a dandelion, put them together and make crowns. And it was a wonderful imaginary children's toy. And it's really fun when they come into that thistle and you get to blow them into your neighbor's yard. It's a really fun toy. How could something that fun be bad? More than that, the little yellow flowers are kind of pretty when there's nothing else good going on in the spring. And more than that, the leaves and the stalks can actually be eaten. There's an entire book, a hundred delicacy recipes of what to do with dandelions. Who knew? And how bad could it be? We're already eating kale. It can't be worse than that. <laughs> so is this a weed? Or is it, in fact, a beautiful, lovely, playful, and delicacy of a plant? Who called it a weed? It's hard to tell sometimes what is a weed and what's a plant. My very first job as a child growing up in rural Alabama, and all of Alabama is kind of rural, but this was really rural Alabama, the only job 
uh, to oppress underage workers was to work in the cotton fields. So I would work in Uncle BJ's cotton field along with my cousins in the summer, 50 cents an hour, it was really good, until we could get a real job in town at the Dairy Queen or something. So this is what you did early on, and we called it chopping cotton. Some of you from the deep south will be familiar with this. And the, what happens is the cotton comes up out of the ground, and there's a weed that comes up that looks very much like cotton. It's actually called morning glory. Now, why anybody would want to slay morning glory, it sounds like an Easter hymn, Jeff, morning glory. But anyway, morning glories would eventually choke out the cotton. So Uncle BJ had the cousins weeding out the morning glories. The trouble is... We weren't very good at being able to tell what was morning glory and what wasn't. So we'd get to the end of the row with sweated brow, trying to please Uncle BJ, only to have him say that we were standing in a pile of slain cotton with well-protected morning glories up and down the row. <laughs> we meant well. We just couldn't tell the difference between weed and wheat. They looked so similar. I guess that's why it was called chopping cotton. We mainly chopped cotton. It's hard to tell sometimes. And a lot of weeds are this way. Actually, a raspberry or blackberry vine is a weed. It's a thistle. But during a certain time of the year, it produces those wonderful blackberries and raspberries. And wouldn't it be terrible if we didn't have that? How could something that tastes that good be a, be a weed? Or honeysuckles. You ever smelled honeysuckles? They grow along the fence rows of country lanes. Can anything that smells that good be a weed? Or how about Queen Anne's lace? More delicately embroidered than your grandmother could have done. Could anything that beautiful be a, a weed? Hard to tell sometimes. Or for that matter, weed. Marijuana. Of course there's the, hey, got any weed, man, bro? There's that form of it. Uh, but for the other 49 states, you can't have that. But how many people are putting that CBD oil extract from this plant, cures everything from asthma to acne to sore knees, and allow you to play tennis another year. And so suddenly, it cures everything, it seems like, what has always been the weed. Maybe there's even value from that. It's just hard to tell. So this master is saying to the well-intended servants, you're not as good at this as you think you are. You're going to create a lot of friendly fire wounding of things that I really value. And I'd, I really would encourage you to kind of sheath your weapon. Put your sickle away. Uh, let's just sit and think about this a minute. Because it's hard. And you're not good at it. To distinguish. Sometimes you want to divide everything into good and evil. Black and white. Or red and blue. <laughs> Uh, us and them. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those who think there's two kinds of people in the world and those who don't. <laughs> uh, but the older we get, the more we're aware there's a lot of shades of gray, actually. Uh, and maybe that's why Jesus is saying, you need to grow up a little bit and be aware of the great variety. Uh, be careful. Because you're not as good at this as you think. Sometimes it's good to tap the brakes, take a chill pill, and let God season us. So the master says, just wait. Let them grow a little longer. It's my field, after all, not yours. This would be really great if the church could learn this, for instance. Because through this Christian centuries, the church well-meaning in an effort to root out the heretics or the unorthodox or the whatever else was outside the middle center, sometimes we have taken the sling blade and the sickle and slain many of God's wheat because they just didn't seem to add up and look like, they look like weeds to us, right? We have members, two members of our church. I just love these two. <laughs> they could not be more different and could not find anything to agree about in the political spectrum. One listens to one to Fox, the other one listens to MSNBC, but they're, they're, they're members of this same church, they can share the same hymnal, they actually live in the community where Connie and I live, they can share the same little circle there, and they laugh with each other, and they respect each other, and they love each other, and somehow the red and the blue between them is some kind of mixed up purple, because however much they're passionate about things that matter to them, they've never let it blind them to what in fact they still hold in common, they love their passionate Americans. 
and they love the Lord, and they love the city, and you know, and they've never overlooked the big things because they didn't agree on the smaller things. And even though they're not, even though those are important, you know, there are people who cannot have friendships or even family relationships across the aisle of something different from them. Some of us have gotten so good at being at war with the weeds, we cannot any longer be at peace with the wheat. Jesus once said, the risen Lord, to a church in Revelation, it's in the second or third chapter before you get scared of reading any further, so you may have read this before, uh, to the church at Laodicea. He commended them because they cared about orthodoxy. But he said, this is still what I have against you. You've lost your first love. You remember that? That doesn't mean you're not still married to your first spouse. You've lost your first love literally is translated, you don't love like you did at first. Sometimes even Christian people and whole Christian churches have gotten so interested at warring with the weeds that they've sort of lost that peaceful, joyous, loving, trusting spirit that was also part of what God was trying to harvest in each of us. And that may be why this master is saying to them, look, I care about rightness too. I'm glad you do, but don't let your zeal take you too far into the field. Not yet. Even in a given moment, it's hard to know what is good and what is bad. I read a book recently called We Got Fired. <laughs> it's a collection of biographies about people who what they have in common is they got fired from a job earlier in their life. And because of that, and only because of that, they ended up doing the thing that we all know them as famous for. It would not have happened had that terrible moment not have happened. Was that a weed moment or a wheat moment? Same way in our lives. You remember when she broke up with you? Your lifelong cherished love? You're in third grade, how terrible that was? <laughs> but if she had not broken up with you, and a series after that maybe, you would never have married the person that you cannot imagine your life without. You win the lottery. Isn't that great? And yet some people would say that sudden wealth was the beginning of the unraveling of our entire family structure. It's hard to know in a moment what was good. A heart attack. My dad had a heart attack at 70. Crusty, rugged, World War II vet, you know, Navy guy. My dad would have told you that the best decade of his life was the last 10 years after the heart attack because he appreciated sunrises and hugs and family and food, and another day to be alive. And he said, I love you, son, more in that last 10 years than in the other 70 before that. Abraham Maslow, the great psychologist, after his heart attack, he told his friends, I'm moving my birthday to the date of my heart attack because that's been the beginning of the best part of my life. Now, a heart attack's a terrible thing, but is it? Oh, well, it's just hard to know. What's a weed and what's a weed? There's an old Chinese story, a kind of a Zen parable about a guy who had a beloved son and an almost equally beloved horse, and one day the horse ran away. And all the neighbors came and said, oh, that's so bad. And he said, uh, we'll see. Because then the horse came back bringing 12 other horses, wild horses. So now he had 13 horses. And so all the neighbors came back over and said, oh, this is great. But he said, uh, we'll see. Because then his son was trying to break one of the horses, but fell off the horse and broke his arm. And the neighbors came over and said, oh, that's terrible. He said, well, we'll see. Because then the emperor came and was rounding up all of the able-bodied young men to have to go serve in the war, but wouldn't take his son because he had a broken arm. And the neighbors all came over and, well, you know what he said. Anyway, so <laughs> you get the point. It's hard to know in a given moment. It takes, more, it takes a longer time or a divine eye to really know. And the truth is, this is true of people. We tend to look from this parable and say, well, I wonder, I wonder if she's a weed. I wonder if he's a wheat. You know, which one of us is a weed and which one of us is a wheat? Look at the person to your right and left. See if you can figure that out. <laughs> if you're married to them, you probably are right. But uh, <laughs> sometimes we think that, am I a wheat person or a wheat person? And we usually think of ourselves as a wheat person. And then that's a pretty small step to go from that to thinking, well, let's kind of clear this field out of all the weed people. Right? It doesn't take very long to get to there. You'll know if someone like that is just... You know of someone who always has to be right and have the last word? You married to someone like that? I can see it going on. <laughs> when the truth is, the 
The truth is, we're all just kind of a hybrid. Maybe our place in this parable is not, am I a weed or am I a wheat? Maybe our place in the parable is to say, I'm the field. I've got weed and wheat in me. How about you? You ever known somebody who did wonderful good and had great skills and made a real difference, but also really had some particular flaws? Have you ever known someone who was really, really visibly flawed that you thought no good could come from and yet watch something really wonderful happen from them? The truth is, we're all just like this master's field, one big mess. One glorious mess. And the God who loves the whole field, who's willing to risk fat weeds even in order to make sure there's fat wheat, the master who says, I'll sort it out. You really don't have to. Just be at peace. That's the master who, in fact, gathered us into this field today, too. Because you just don't know. In the deep south, we have a plant called kudzu. Watch out, it's coming. Uh, it was introduced to this country in 1876 at the centennial of the U.S. Uh, country. Uh, but it became the darling of the Soil Conservation Service in Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas because they thought it would be the way to hold back the erosion lest all of those states just kind of erode into the Gulf of Mexico. So they planted 84 million seedlings of kudzu all across the south because it, because it grew so fast. It'll grow a, a, a whole foot in a day. In a growing season, you could plant it at one end zone and it would get to the other end zone. So when you go across those parts of the south, you see whole waves of kudzu. Oh, it looks like just a green Appalachian hills, but those humps are actually cows that weren't paying attention and got, <laughs> you know. And, and the bigger little hill is just someone who went to Florida for the winter, and when they came back, it had taken over the whole house. The, the joke about kudzu, if you're going to plant it, you better drop it and run, you know. It was just, it just, it's... Its joy was also its curse. It just grows and cannot be stopped. There used to be 20,000 people in kudzu clubs all across the South in the 30s and 40s. Young Southern Bells vied to be kudzu queen of their little town. It was the darling, but now it has been seriously downgraded. It is officially a weed. And those of us, those of us from the South would love to give our, get our hands on the first person who planted a kudzu planting kind of like the way I feel about the first person who invented robocalls. Same thing. <laughs> now there's a weed. Anyway, <clears throat> it's hard to tell. So what is this text trying to say? Because we're not good at it, because we've got, frankly, quite enough to tend to in our own field without having to poke into everybody else's, because the world could use a kinder, gentler, more tolerant group of people starting with us, because God isn't simply done yet. It's too soon to tell what God is up to for all those reasons. Have you ever seen a coffee mug or a t-shirt that has that phrase, be patient, God isn't finished with me yet? It'd be great if we just handed those out to you on the way out, but that's kind of what we're talking about here. Yes, this world and all of us in it are one big glorious mess but it's God's glorious mess. And he loves the whole field. At the end of the day, he separates out things because only he's good at it. And even the weeds were carefully collected and bundled because in an era like this of Palestine where there's no firewood, that actually was what formed the fire that baked the bread. Like these wonderful arrangements from our Blumen ministry, all of them weeds and wild grasses. And somehow it was more beautiful and crackling and aromatic because the fire was even sweeter coming from weeds like that. And the bread therefore even tasted heavenly, like a Eucharist. Because, because finally the farmer's hands had learned to be at peace in the glorious mess. I would like to learn how to live like that 
wouldn't you? Amen? Amen. Amen. With the Lord.